Well, welcome to lesson 13, uh, part B, the second part of the interlocked Bible study. And uh, we've been working our way through the Old Testament, and we'll eventually get to all the way to the New Testament and the book of Revelation, uh, covering the historical narrative of God's word. So we take the story and, and we visit each one in its chronology, in chronological order, and, and uh, open our hearts and our minds to what message it is that God is trying to communicate to his creation. If everything indeed was created by him, then it means our creator has also a message for us. He wants us to get to know him, to know him, and to make him known throughout all the nations of the world. And so it behooves us to first explore uh, who he is and to, um, uh, to find out how it is he revealed himself to mankind uh, starting from the beginning and working all the way through this thing we call the meta narrative, the big story, all the way to the end, and we find ourselves in in right now in the the story or the account of the Exodus and now the giving of the law. So our first part of the lesson uh, explained a few uh, key elements of the giving of the law and how it's relational, how it's relational. It's uh, not a cold, uh, cold book of law uh, and of rules that people are to observe uh, strictly. Uh, it is a book of relationship. It's a, the, the law was founded uh, on God's invitation to Israel uh, as his son, he claimed Israel as his son, and now this, there's this relationship between father and son, and the father is establishing the code of conduct within this father-son relationship. Uh, however, the son, in our case, is an individual, but in, in God's eyes, Israel, the nation, which consisted of uh, several million people, and would grow, continue to grow to even more. Uh, the sonship was uh, applicable to all the nation, every individual within that. So the relationship was established by God. So this is where we left off. We see that this law that God gave to uh, Israel uh, in on Mount Sinai and meeting up with them in the desert <clears throat> was had this particular format. It was not impersonal. It was not just a code of rules. It, uh, it did not deal with just the external things. Uh, for example, if, uh, if a policeman or an attorney um, was to judge a person, uh, it would have to be based on their conduct. Whereas this law of God uh, was is directed at the heart, the internal, the, the invisible, uh, that which is taking place inside. Whereas typically laws, uh, civil law, is designed to um, uh, judge the external behavior of mankind and then punish accordingly. So the motivation for these uh, civil laws is to avoid punishment. I will determine to stay 45 and under when the speed limit indicates that. Um, that way I can avoid the consequences of that, the punishment, which would be considered a ticket, the red and blue lights behind um, where the cop is pulling you over for speeding and going over the speed limit. He gives you a, um, a ticket, <clears throat> which in, you have to go pay. So it's painful to our pockets when that happens, and it's very embarrassing. So there's, there's this consequence, and, and we seek to avoid punishment. So it's, it's based on fear, the avoiding of punishment, whereas God's law is personal. It's, it deals with the heart, and it's based on gratitude. He said, because I, I took you out, I rescued you out from the land of Egypt, from slavery to foreigners, 
um, now then don't have any other gods before me. It's based on gratitude uh, out of out of thankfulness and appreciation for this relationship that I've now entered into with my creator, uh, Yahweh, Jehovah. Um, I, out of gratitude, seek to obey and, and to uh, uh, conduct my life in a way that is pleasing to God, to my father. So this God, this law that was given at Mount Sinai uh, in the Mosaic Covenant was indeed relational at at its core. So why did God give them this law? Um, It was not to uh, completely control their behavior, although there were behavioral issues that were brought to light. So although it was was focused on the heart, indeed, there were behavioral issues. For example, uh, here in Exodus 22, 1, it states, if someone steals, so here we're talking about a, a bad behavior, it is not good to steal, there's property rights, and people who own something uh, deserve to uh, preserve their their ownership of that. And anyone who who steals, that is bad conduct. That is morally wrong. So God is saying, okay, if you steal an ox or a sheep, so this is just one, one ox or one sheep, then kills or sells it, the thief must pay back five oxen for each ox stolen and four sheep for each sheep stolen. So God's law does indeed um, dictate conduct. It does touch on um, behavioral issues and the consequences thereof, the punishment or the the recompense uh, of that. Uh, So it's not that God's law only touches on the heart, but it also does on the conduct. However, it is much different than all the other uh, laws on the wor- in the earth on, in, in different nations around the world in that no other nation uh, is like God's law where it touches on the issues of the heart. So here in Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 to 22, bear with me as I read through these, these verses uh, as, and, and, and pay attention to how God is, is dealing with the heart and not just the conduct. Verse 12, and now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and to live in a way that pleases him and to love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And you must always obey the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. Look, the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it all belong to the Lord your God. Yet the Lord chose your ancestors as the objects of his love. And he chose you, their descendants, above all other nations, as is evident today. Therefore, change your hearts and stop being stubborn. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome God who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you too must show love. To foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and worship him and cling to him. Your oaths must be in his name alone. He alone is your God, the only one who is worthy of your praise, the one who has done these mighty miracles that you have seen with your own eyes. When your ancestors went down to Egypt, there were only 70 of them. But now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. So you see the language that that God is using in his law with the Israelite nation speaks very much to the heart. 
It is, there is no other law in any country, not even in the United States or, or other democracy run countries. Um, it is, uh, uh, those are laws that, that uh, ba are based on your behavior. This is a law that is focused on the heart when especially it uses language like fear the Lord, love him, serve him with all your heart and soul for, uh, for your own good or change your hearts and, and stop being stubborn. And because God shows love to foreigners, so you too must show love. So this, this, this law of God contains encouragement. It contains care, nurturing persuasion, reassurance, and advice. It, it, it looks more like a father and son relationship than it does a citizen of a particular country. Um, and it captures that. It captures that father-son relationship. And so that is indeed what this is all about. Um, it is God, God's law given at Mount Sinai. At the core of it is relationship. Uh, that's not what we often hear. We often hear uh, it said, well, we are dead to the law. And that is true today as Christians. We are dead to the law, but it was replaced with the law of Christ, which we will be going on into more detail here throughout this study. Um, uh, but this particular law, uh, although it does demonstrate to us our, our weakness and our sinfulness and, and our inability to be perfect and to become perfect, uh, and that we do not reach a <clears throat> the standard of perfection and holiness of God, although it does demonstrate that, and it is a tool uh, to show us and to lead us to Christ, who is indeed the answer. Um, this law was given to Israel for Israelite at that time as a father uh, in his relationship to his son. So this, this, law worked very well for the uh, God's relationship with this earthly kingdom. Um, it was not something that uh, God made a bad mistake and it was, a, it was, it was not a, uh, that law was, was a, a bad thing. And that's why we as Christians don't obey the Mosaic law today. And it's not, none, none of this is for us or pertinent to us. Uh, no, it was it was God's message and 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 code of conduct and 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 His relationship, a re revelation of His relationship with the, a, a human people uh, called Israel for that time, and it was based on relationship. Now, can we or anyone police uh, this law? It is impossible. Police can only uh, check people's behavior. And uh, like if I break a speed limit or if, uh, if there's some sort of conduct that is against the law, uh, a, a policeman has the authority to uh, apprehend me. And maybe, maybe I am judged and go to, a ju to jail and I'm held there for, for days or months or even years, depending on the gravity of my behavior. But it's all behavioral issues. It's external stuff. But this God's law, uh, it can't be policed by humans because it, is, it deals with the heart. How can I know if you fear God or not? I can't know. The only thing I can do is observe your behavior. I can see the outworking of the fear of God in your life. I can see the practical outworking of that. I can see the practical outworking of your love, where it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. I can see the practical outworking of that. But I certainly can't see your love. That, that's something that happens inside of you and I that is invisible to one another. It is, it is a very intimate and personal thing that only God, uh, Yahweh, our creator, has the ability to view and to see and to judge and determine our motivations and to be checked. Our conduct can be checked by other humans, but our motivations, our thoughts, and our hearts cannot be checked by other humans. So this, again, is a relationship between God, the, the, 
the designer and creator of our soulishness. We are soulish people. We have a, a body. We have a mind. We have a soul. Our spirit, that spiritual aspect of us, is invisible to one another. And, and it is completely visible and relational with God. And so only God can really determine the, the, uh, the, the basis of the, our conduct and the basis of, of, of our love or, or, or whether we are in check or not. Because this law of God is focused on the heart. So this is where uh, many people confused, uh, including uh, the Pharisees and even throughout Israel itself and, and its period of, of, of development as a nation, much confusion. Uh, they did not understand relationship as they were, were to. But let's, let's continue to see how God uh, looks at this. First Samuel uh, 16, 7, in the context of the choosing of a king um, through the prophet Samuel. And Samuel was going to find this king in, in a particular family line. And God is instructing Samuel what is important to him. He says, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance. So this guy, Jesse, has a lot of different sons. And some of them were extremely good looking and, and, and warriors and, and, and were the, they seemed outwardly the best option for as, as king of Israel. But the Lord says, don't judge by these different sons' appearances, by their height, uh, for I have rejected him. He's talking about the firstborn. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them, Samuel. Uh, people judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And again, it, the, the rest of that story goes to how uh, the last and final son of Jesse, who is the shepherd, uh, his name David, was chosen by God and anointed by Samuel to be the next king following Saul over the people of God. <clears throat> so, Again, God is looking at the heart. In Isaiah 29, 13, it says this. The Lord says, the people, these people come near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me. So it's not that they lacked in worship. They were expert worshipers. Reminds you perhaps of Christianity today. We're expert worshipers. But God is saying to Israel here, uh, but it's based on merely human rules. They have been taught. So actions in and of themselves to God are meaningless if the heart issues are not dealt with. A person can, can have the most beautiful and glorious worship styles voices. Uh, they could dress excellent properly. Maybe, maybe they're really sharp dressers. And when they go to church or wherever they go, they just look classy. But all these things are external. Not to saying the external is excluded. It's just saying that, no, God's places the most importance on his relationship with man. And that relationship is not based on external conduct, but on the heart. So it's very, very important that we understand that uh, God's law, the giving of his law, was based on relationship. And the consequences of obedience, the uh, consequences of a, a heart that is uh, righteous before God, that is declared righteous by God, a heart that filled with faith and trust in God, uh, the, the consequences of obedience are blessing. We will live well, it says. And his, his message to Israel was that there would be blessing in the land that they will live in. There will be peace. 
uh, from the nations that surrounds them. There will be safety for them. There will be plentiful, plenty of food, plenty of wealth to go around. There will be land. Uh, there'll be pleasure. There'll be enjoyment uh, of God and and with, of one another in in our relationship with Him and and with our our neighbor, our community. So people misunderstand this, though, uh, and this is where legalism comes in. That word legalism we hear often. And it's very much applied to today in our New Testament principles. It was definitely prevalent in the time of Jesus. So legalism uh, is all about behavior and conduct. Legalism is all about uh, the superficial. It it's, does not deal with the heart. Um, it deals with our how we look, how we smell, <laughs> how, we, how we talk. Uh, what we don't say. Um, it's a bunch of cold, hard rules. And you will find you, yourselves uh, often in, 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 in touch with uh, or, or interacting with legalistic communities, communities that are all about the form, how things are done, what they look like, what color the carpet is, or what color the the walls are, or um, uh, what the preacher looks like, or or what what the parishioners are supposed to be uh, driving, or or what they do in the church. Some people say I can swear outside of church, but I can't swear in church, and it's all about the behavior. And legalism is 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 placed as the superficial uh, coating of, over our wicked hearts. <laughs> And so the core issue is never dealt with. The core issue being something evil called sin, something unfortunately we inherited from Adam and Eve and was passed along through Noah and his family and passed along to us today. And so God's law cannot, it cannot cleanse the heart. It, however, God's law deals with the heart. It reveals heart issues. But the heart can only be dealt with by grace through faith in God's word. And it's relational. So the Pharisees got this wrong. They, they, they took it to the, uh, a completely different level. <clears throat> they built off of the Mosaic law, the Levitical law. They, they built off of that. They constructed their own religion on top of that. Um, and so the, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees of the time of Jesus uh, wrestled with things. Like here, here's the Sabbath, for example, uh, an example of legalism. And Jesus, the Son of God, uh, living as a holy man and God in the flesh among men, among, and specifically Israel, uh, address this with the people of that time. In Mark 3, 1 to 6, Jesus said uh, he went to the, uh, into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and said, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. So Jesus knew their hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once, the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. So this is a direct confrontation between Jesus, the author of the law, the Lord of the Sabbath. He was confronting this pharisaical uh, religion of legalism, which is cold and heartless and mechanical and focused on heart issues. It, uh, uh, God was revealing uh, that the Sabbath was for rest. 
It was for the benefit of man. It was for his good. It was so that man could be refreshed from all the hard work throughout the week and, and remember their God. Uh, it was it not a time to party and get drunk and wine or whatever alcoholic beverages they had at the time? Uh, it was a time of remembrance of God and his law and, and family being together, uh, celebrating God's goodness. The Sabbath was not to become a burden. It was, it was, it was there for their good. <clears throat> of refreshment. The Pharisees depersonalized it and perverted God's law and made it into a list of do's and don'ts. And Jesus was challenging their thinking, bringing it around to hard issues. In Mark 2, 27, Jesus says the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people, not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So, God's focus is on the heart, not man's behavior. Man's behavior, uh, when, when, when it flows from the heart, is pleasing to God. But man's good behavior with a wicked heart is not acceptable by God. It is displeasing to him because the relationship is not there. God is focused on reconciliation of man, sinful man with a holy God. He always has been focused on the heart. And then the, the conduct comes with a good heart. It's, it flows from just like a tree has roots and draws from the good nourishment of the ground, the water from the sky <clears throat> and the nourishment from the ground <clears throat> and produces fruit. Um, a good apple tree does not produce poison. It produces delicious, sweet apples. And so no matter how fake and phony a, uh, an apple could look, uh, um, you, you uh, it can, it's only going to produce that which comes from the, the roots. The heart has to produce good behavior. <clears throat> um, uh, phony fruit is not pleasing. <clears throat> so how does Israel then respond to this covenant, this new covenant? That is an upgrade, if you will. Now, I don't know about an upgrade, but it was, it, was, it was a second covenant established by God with the people of Israel from, first of all, the Adamic, for the, from Adam's covenant uh, to Noah's covenant, uh, and, and now to the covenant with Moses and Israel. So how did they respond? It says here in Exodus 24, 7, then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud to the people. And they all responded, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. We will obey. Of course, we're going to do everything down to uh, every I that's dotted, every T that's crossed. We're going to, we're going to nail this thing, is Israel's response. Had, had Israel really taken stock of their historical record up to that point, they would have seen that they had heart issues. <laughs> uh, they were complainers, they were grumblers, they were faithless, and, and that was just to get from Egypt to Mount Sinai. There are so many issues along the way. Had they really taken stock, I don't think they would have jumped into this as eagerly, but guess what this is a reflection of? Pride. And boy, are you and I susceptible to the same thing that Israel had. Pride. Ah, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to nail this, Lord Jesus. I'm going to be a, the best Christian and disciple ever. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to go there, and I'm going to do that, and I, I, I. And that is our humanistic tendency. I will do this, and I am going to do that, uh, I'm, and I'm going to be the best missionary ever, the best pastor ever. I'm going to be the best 
uh, Christian worker ever in, in, in my workplace. I'm, I'm going to be the best, uh, especially now that we're starting um, New Year's. I'm going to, I'm going to make resolutions that, uh, that uh, are, are, are going to eat well this year. I'm going to lose weight, if you will. I'm going to get at more exercise. And I, I, I'm going to do all these things. And in, in our pride, we often set these high and lofty goals. But we are weak people. Israel was weak. There was an element that they had that created this weakness called sin. Okay. So God, knowing their hearts, he places witnesses uh, against them. Just witnesses. Witnesses serve to uh, judge. Um, to to demonstrate truth and 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 lies. So a witness. If you have two or three witnesses between parties, you can say, "Yep, yeah, uh, Johnny was there present, and he remembers our agreement together." So God establishes witnesses uh, between um, when He gives the law of uh, at Mount Sinai. He He establishes the these three witnesses: the law. The law itself, a song, and heavens and earth. So let's let's look at these three witnesses quickly. So first of all, let's look at the book of the law. Um, so the, the 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 text, the text of the law that was written down and to be copied over generations and generations and generations of 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 copies made written down meticulously by the jewish people and 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 pr- uh, accurately preserved into what we have today as the bible the old testament um, is a witness between god and israel and the, of this covenant Deuteronomy 31, 24 says this, when Moses had finished writing this entire body of instruction in a book, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. Take this book of instruction and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, so it may remain there as a witness against the people of Israel. Why use the word against? Where, Where... What's this idea of, of, of using it against them? Well, <clears throat> the people of Israel, when, when the, the book of the law is read, it, will, it, it is like a comparison. This is what the book of the law says, and this is what you've, your conduct is like. So every time this book of the law is read, people's, ju- people's conduct or their hearts uh, are judged. And so it is a witness against. Um, every time they would break the law, there would be uh, um, this witness saying, you broke the law. You broke the law. Oh, guess what? You broke the law again. Oh, look what it says here. Uh, so-and-so broke the law. Uh, Johnny and, and, and Jill over there, they broke the law. Look at what it says here. So it's a witness against. Every time someone would break the law, there is this reminder, this witness. Um, and, and Moses says, surely these people are going to break the law. <laughs> the next one, and this is, is Moses's song. It was the national anthem of Israel. Um, it goes like this, Deuteronomy 31. This is the song. So write down the words of this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Help them learn it so it may serve as a witness for me against them for i will bring them into the land i swore to give their ancestors a land flowing with milk and honey there they will become prosperous eat all the food they want and become fat but they will begin to worship other gods they will despise me and break my covenant so god and his all-knowing uh, ability, his I- infinite ability to know the past, present, and future, and everything that happens in between from eternity to eternity, he knew what they were going to do. And so he established this song as a witness. This song is written in Deuteronomy chapter 32. 
please take the time uh, to read it uh, uh, after this study. Uh, check it out. Go read through Deuteronomy 32, and you'll see the content. But this was like Israel's national anthem, and it, and it was a reminder to them of their fa fallacies, that they were going to fail. It was a prophecy. Um, God for, foretold uh, what Israel's conduct would be like, that they would be worshiping other idols who were actually demons, that they would break his law, that disaster would come upon them uh, due to their unfaithfulness, but that ultimately God would restore them. So that's one of the summaries of, of how it was, what this, that song goes. And, and so as they would sing this national anthem, they would be singing a prophecy uh, against them. And the other neat characteristic of this national anthem is that it was written by God. Uh, what country in this world do you know that has a national anthem that is prophecy and that is written by God? Uh, Israel's, Israel's nation and their national anthem was very unique. Um, so it says here uh, in Deuteronomy 31, 21, and when, and when great disasters come down on them, this song will stand as evidence against them, for it will never be forgotten by their descendants. I know the intentions of these people, even now before they have entered the land, I swore to give them. Uh, so that the very, that very day, Moses wrote down the words of the song and taught it to the Israelites. So now there's a third witness that we'll look at. It's called the heavens and earth. Who are these people, the heavens and earth? Deuteronomy 31, 28 to 29 says, Now summon all the elders and officials of your tribes so that I can speak to them directly and call heaven and earth to witness against them. I know that after my death, this is Moses speaking, you will become utterly corrupt and will turn from the way I have commanded you to follow. In the days to come, disaster will come down on you, for you will do what is evil in the Lord's sight, making him very angry with your actions. So who are these heavenly beings and earthly beings? Uh, Deuteronomy 31, uh, 32, 1 says, Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth the words I say. So the heavens is referring to the angelic beings, not clouds, not rain, not sun, not moon. Those are not living beings, but we're speaking of angels. Angelic beings would be a witness uh, against Israel, uh, observing the, the signing of the contract between the two parties of the father and the son. Uh, Israel, the sun, and earth. So we human beings, every time we read the word of God, every time we read the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and we look at Israel's conduct, we can say, ooh, uh, they're really weak on this point. Oh, yeah, they, they, they do. They keep the Sabbath really well. Okay, that, that they're good there. But Oh, man, in this area of, of idolatry, whoo, wow, they're, they're really struggling there. Um, they messed up. <clears throat> so as we read God's law, we participate uh, as judges, as witnesses between these, these two parties. So in summary, there's these three witnesses. The law, uh, which is based on a contract. It gives the standard of righteousness. Uh, that God and his people agreed upon. Then there's the song. This is the prophetic testimony of what the Israelites will do in the future concerning the law. And then there's uh, the heavens and earth. This is the third party testimony. People looking at how the Israelites behaved and can tell if they kept the law or not. So what's the verdict? What, what, what happened with all of this? What's the conclusion? Well, the verdict is, as the judgment falls on Israel uh, based on their conduct, unfortunately, all three of these witnesses come into agreement that they failed. They failed miserably. Israel failed miserably. So the law 
uh, is the, the contract that is read aloud every seven years with, within Israel so that the people of Israel knew for sure that they were breaking the contract. It was a reminder. You, got, you guys messed up again. <laughs> and then the song which prophesied, the song, uh, uh, it was fulfilled, that they were indeed a bad testimony to the nations around them. And those looking upon them, the, the, the angels and, and, and even us today, we, as we read God's law, we see that they failed. So in their pride, they said, yep, yep, we're going to do this. We're going we're gonna to become really, 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 really good God followers. We're going to be really, really, really good sons. But they were weak. Although they tried to be good, they found themselves uh, weak failing and witnesses uh, against them showing that it reminding them of their failures so who are the prosecuting attorney attorneys these are these are god's prophets god sent prophets to the people of israel as these like attorneys that says this you failed on this point this point and this point and this point Okay, so it's like being in a court of law, uh, and and now you're under judgment. Oh man, we really failed it. We really messed things up this time. And the the prophets were there to remind them: you sinned here. You've 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 followed after Baal, after Ashereth. Uh, you've you have committed the uh, the evils that the nations before you committed, that God destroyed. And they're constantly reminded. So Isaiah was one of them. He said to them, listen, O heavens. Here's reminding them of the heavens again. Pay attention, earth. This is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. Even an ox knows its owner. And a donkey recognizes its master's care. Even, the, even a, a dumb ox. Have, have you heard that expression? Even a dumb ox. It doesn't say dumb here, but that's the Im implications. Have you ever heard of oh, your stubborn donkey? <laughs> There's some more. There's other words that are even more ex uh, um, um, explanatory of, of a donkey. And, but they're stubborn as all get out. So even these dumb ox and a stubborn donkey, uh, they know who their masters are. But Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them, this relationship between father and son. So these prophets were sent, like Isaiah, and, and they reminded the people. There was a, 133 prophets that were named in the Bible. Now, there were more prophets than that, but they went unnamed. So there are 133 of these prophets named in the Bible. An interesting fact is 16 of them were women, okay, 16 women, and their jobs were to write down biblical history, so they were faithful in inscribing it, writing it down, as interpreted by God, so God is saying, this is how I see how things happen and should go and what, what my perspective is on, so that they were faithful to God's word and his interpretation, and they taught the people about God. They instructed, and, and they give the, the people God's promises and, and prophecies about the future. Uh, as lawyer, this was a very important job for the prophets. Um, so uh, we see that they warn the people that if you were not obedient, uh, you're going to fall under a curse. And it was in our last lesson, part A of uh, this um, lesson 13, we looked at the different levels of cursings or curses that would fall upon Israel as a consequence of their disobedience and rejection of Yahweh as their God and as their Lord and King. And so the prophets would remind the people, if you don't obey God's law, if you don't follow through with your, your responsibilities, if you don't change your heart, 
you're going to fall under these natural consequences that, uh, and cursings um, and, uh, and, and go through the different stages uh, of once again back into slavery as they were found as they found themselves in Egypt, they would go back under slavery to the nations around them. Let's continue with uh, this principle uh, of Mount Sinai. So we want to be reminded ourselves as we go through this giving of the law and an observation of Israel's behavior and Israel's response to God's law and, and, and their evident failure of obedience of God's law, we see that really this relationship was established with Israel before in, in, in uh, Egypt. The, what happened first before God gives them this law is salvation. They were invited, first of all, to trust him. Uh, they were not, God did not tell them to clean up their act before he gave them the law. This law was based on faith, based on uh, the change of heart, based on relationship, based on love uh, between a father and son. It was not based on just this cold uh, uh, I'm, I'm the big head honcho God up here, and by golly, you're going to do what I tell you. It was not based on that kind of uh, uh, relationship, but one of a father and son. First of all, Israel had to be reconciled to himself, bought back, uh, purchased, uh, redeemed from their slavery in Egypt. And he did this through the shedding of blood, uh, the shedding of a lamb's blood. And uh, demonstrating to him that salvation comes by faith and faith alone in God's word. And that faith leads to uh, obedience. And that there must be shedding of blood for there to be remission from sin. And there must be shedding of blood. And, and, and so this is grace. God condemned the, the elder sons, the firstborn sons of each, each and every person in Egypt, including the Israelites. But he provided them a way of salvation uh, through the shedding of a lamb's, innocent lamb's blood. So this had to happen. They had to go through this experience before God gave them the law. And so his, his appeal to them with the law is based on relationship that is their sonship that was already then established. So salvation for us today is the same thing. Um, before, before we start spouting off the law of God to people, well, how they should act and what they should do, what they should look like or what they should say or not say, or, or, um, what their, their core values should be. We have to invite people just like God invited Israel <clears throat> into relationship with him through the shedding of blood of an innocent lamb, we too invite the unbelieving world around us into relationship with Jesus Christ, who is the innocent lamb, who shed his blood once and for all, for all of mankind, for all the nations of the world, to be able to believe on him, look upon him by faith and say, he is our savior. He is the one and only way which my my heart can be dealt with, my sin issue can be dealt with, where I can be reconciled back to my, re my maker, my redeemer, my, my creator. My sin issue can be dealt with. I have to we, uh, trust him. I invite other people to trust him, just like I have. Uh, I, I invite God, other people to, to be saved by God and redeemed out of their, the, the, the slavery to the sin in which they were born. And then, and only then, is there the, uh, the way that man can begin to uh, walk and order his ways after uh, his heart, after the heart of the Father, and to know his his. Um, what his what pleases him, what 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 uh, honors him, what glorifies him, and uh, and and that and how that is 
prospers our heart. It prospers our life when our heart is, is pursuing a relationship with him. So the, the law of God is a good law. There's nothing inherently wrong about it. We just cannot mix. We cannot separate that salvation must happen first. Redemption has to happen first. Reconciliation has to happen first in the relationship between man and God before any kind of law is established. Now, I want to remind you, and we'll look again at this in, in, in depth later on, that we no longer are subject today to the Mosaic law, whereas Jesus Christ established a new covenant, a new covenant which we celebrate every, every so often, uh, some weekly, some regularly, some monthly, in, 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 in a ceremony we call the Lord's Supper, the communion. Uh, we see how Christ establishes a new law, um, one that is, again, relationship, relational. And therefore, today, we, we are not lawless people. We follow the law of Christ. And, and Christ says, I come to me, all ye who are burdened and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. My, my yoke is light. My, my, uh, um, uh, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So the law of Christ, which we are under today, is a law of relationship with him. It is where our conduct is, is, is uh, it come, it, it's, it's a, a manifestation of, of the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ and the reconciliation that we have with him uh, based on his death, burial, and resurrection. So it's not that everyone's just free to do whatever they want to now. Oh, I'm free from the law, the Mosaic law. No, you. we are still under the law of Christ, but not with the same burden that the Israelites had. Um, and Paul, the apostle, shows how the law is still in effect in the and God is still holy. Uh, Christ's law is still in effect. There's still things that should never be pronounced among us. And he addresses sin issues in the church. For example, in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13, it says, when I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. So Paul is addressing sin issues here that are still prevalent. And even today, um, but I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or, or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You uh, would have, have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges or continues habitually in sexual sin or is continually and habitually practicing greediness or habitually and, and, and continually practicing with the worship of idols or other things that substitute God, or is abusive, continually walking in, 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 in abusive uh, as an abuser, or as a drunkard is constantly under uh, the power of, of alcohol or substance abuse, or that habitually is cheating people. That's characteristic of, of their everyday life is trying to lie to people and cheat them and take advantage of them. Don't even eat with such people. Don't even, don't hang out with them. Don't do it. Avoid them. Especially when they say they're Christians, especially when they say they're Christ followers. Uh, and they're, they're, they're indulging in these things. Don't hang out with them. It's not cool. It's not where, where you want to be. That's how unbelievers act. So Paul, Paul's addressing uh, sin issues here. He's addressing people who are not living in, a, in relationship with Jesus Christ. So uh, our conduct indeed is very important today as well. But let's separate evil conduct of, of Christians uh, versus unbelievers. We cannot seek reformation from unbelievers and hope that unbelievers will somehow become 
Christ-like and become his disciples when they first haven't dealt with the sin issues. We can't tell people to clean up their act. You got to clean up your act before you come to church. By golly, you aren't going to be smoking in my presence. Not, no. If you're, if you're going to come to our Bible study, you better not be drinking alcohol. Let's not go there with unbelievers. Let's, let's establish relationship with unbelievers. Relationship, respect, trust, re relationship with unbelievers in order that we draw them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Once they deal with the sin issue in their life, uh, applying the blood of Jesus Christ to their, their sinfulness, accept him by faith and trust him as their one and only payment for their sin and accept his resurrection life and, and, and receive the Holy Spirit in their life, then we can begin discipling them into how uh, God uh, uh, desires or, uh, uh, us to live in holiness separate from the, the, the things of the world, from bondage, and how we can live in blessing as we, 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 we live in holiness um, and relationship with him. So uh, Paul uh, says here, it's not our responsibility to judge outsiders in their conduct. Don't try to clean up their act. Don't try to judge them. They're just, they're, they were born in sin and, and they need a new Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and to reject uh, Satan and his lordship and his system. It says, but it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. That's his business. But as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. So let's, let's be careful to focus on relationship here. Let's be careful to draw unbelievers into relationship with Jesus Christ so that the sin issue, the heart issue is dealt with first, thus enabling us and empowering us through the power of the Holy Spirit to walk with him in, in newness of life and to help people uh, draw them into a relationship with him as Christians, as disciples of him, and the joy that comes with that, not, not, uh, um, not this legalistic, you better clean up your act after everything. No, there's a time period that it takes time for people to grow in their new relationship as sons and daughters of God. We'll stop there for today, and uh, we'll, we'll continue on with this theme and going deeper and deeper down inside the law of God. Um, in the, our next lesson.